Okay. Hey, everyone. I uh, hope you're all doing well. Um, can everyone hear me? Just to, uh, if a couple of you can just um, message in the chat just to make sure I'm all good. Okay, perfect. Great. So thank you so much um, uh, for being here. We have a full house, which is pretty impressive. So um, thank you so much for your time today. Um, just to give you a heads up, it's going to be about an hour and a half. Um, in terms of timing, that's including time for questions as well. So uh, I've left it at, at least 20 minutes for any questions throughout and also at the end, so you can ask me whatever you like. So um, you will get CPD and all those kind of things. So um, hopefully you can, you can stay tuned for the, for the whole thing. Um, so firstly, I just want to say thank you so much to Maya and Sanjay for um, uh, organizing this uh, for you all at Together Dental. Um, this is a joint initiative and the aims are really to help um, just get you up to speed with everything related to perio. Um, so this is a fairly heavy webinar, but hopefully should be really, really useful. Um, and also hopefully establish a relationship with you guys because um, I'm keen to work with you all um, in all your practices um, in terms of training you up um, uh, as needed. Um, some of you may be interested in things like complexity too. So we can have a, if there's enough scope for that, we can go through that. Um, and hopefully also referring um, patients to my clinic as well in London. So um, we can have, you know, great care and keep it consistent for all the practices and, and all our patients as well. So we thought the best way to kind of get this relationship going is to organize um, this webinar, um, just to give you some uh, updates on Perio, and then we can see where this goes. I mean, I'm, for example, happy to do another webinar on another topic. Um, it's completely up to how you guys find this. Um, and when, you know, COVID is all over, um, I'm happy to come and visit you guys and practice, all those kind of things. So let's just, let's get started and then we can kind of see how things go um, as we progress. But today, um, the title of the webinar is Essentials of Perio Care and General Practice. So as I said, um, it's quite a lot, but hopefully you'll find it really helpful. I will send you the whole presentation. So please do not worry about making notes. I'll literally send it to you as it is right now. Um, so please just, just try and enjoy um, as, we, as we go along. And I know I said enjoy, but um, <laughs> Perry is not obviously the most exciting subject. And you're probably, I'm surprised everyone pretty much attended. Um, from experience, people find it quite boring, Perio. Sometimes you don't get very good results in practice. And, you know, it's not everyone's favorite topic, but I want to try and make it interesting. Um, I want to try and make it more exciting. Um, regardless of whether you like it or not, Perio is important. So it is worth us spending this hour and a half to actually go through everything. It will make a huge, huge difference. Um, I will be answering questions as I go along. So if you have any questions, you can put them in the... Um, either in the chat box or there's actually a Q&A box as well. So feel free to kind of at each sort of section, I'll stop and answer questions to make it a little bit more interactive. Um, but if we just start off on the chat, right? So can anyone, there's lots of you here, can anyone tell me why you think, if, even if it's not your favorite subject, why is perio so important to learn about? Any offers? Come on, guys. Why is Perio so important? Very good, Anka. Straight uh, to the point. Um, it is the most litigious branch of dentistry. So if you're going to get sued, which is going to happen to many of us, um, it's probably be going to be due to Perio. It's at the top of the list in terms of um, litigation. Any other reasons? Yeah, tooth loss, exactly. Um, perfect. Um, the amount of patients affected with it. So it's so common. Um, and there's one more thing. One more thing. You guys are good. So common, it's a common reason to get litigated against. Um, it's a, a reason for tooth loss. What else does it cause? Very good, Stratos. Okay, so you guys, are, we're going to get through this really quickly. So um, uh, it's it can affect general health. Um, so you should be able to see the comments, guys. Uh, yeah, you should be able to. Um, Okay, so um, the reasons why perio is so important, it's worth going over, is it's common, okay? So um, when we go back to work, hopefully very soon, um, you'll be seeing lots of patients with perio, so it's worth knowing about it inside out. It's a public health problem, so it affects general health and quality of life. Um, okay, you can't see the comments. Okay, let me just, just adjust the setting. Just give me two seconds. Uh, I want everyone to be able to see the comments. Four pounds. Yeah, it should work. Right? Yeah. Okay, we 
Continue. What's the problem? You want to draw? You don't want to draw. I do. Not. So, un un. And then click on draw. Okay, fine. Click that. It should work now. So basically, if you um, you have to um, se uh, select at the top, it should say all panels and attendees, then everyone will see your comment. If you don't want everyone to see your comment, which is also fair enough, um, then just put to panelist, are you me? Okay, good. So it's common. Um, so it's important to know about it's a public health problem. So it affects quality of life and general health. This general health thing is a real key um, hot topic right now. So Perio health affects your risk of diabetes, it affects your risk of cardiovascular disease, affects your risk of diabetes complications. It's a real um, big thing right now. In fact, I've had quite a few patients recently literally directly booking in and saying, um, I want to see you because I'm worried I'm going to get Alzheimer's. Can you shake my gums? So if you need to motivate your patients, which is a common problem with perio patients, you can actually say to them there's good enough evidence to suggest that, you know what, Mr. Smith, if we can't get this gum condition under, under control, I do need to let you know it may have an impact on your general health. I mean, when you say things like that to patients, they do start to care. They may not care about their gums or their oral health, but they definitely care about their general health. So it's um, a great motivational factor to bring into your conversations as well. And finally, as you uh, quite rightly said, it's an important topic to go over because it is at the top of the list in terms of litigation. And when we have a look at the pie chart, this is from Dental Protection, it's really quite scary. Um, three quarters of claims are perioneal implant related. Um, and the two common reasons to get listed against are failure to diagnose and failure to refer and at an appropriate time. So if we just go over failure to diagnose, it's not just saying to your patients that you have gum disease. It's saying to them, firstly, how bad it is and the fact that they might um, lose their teeth um, and also writing it in your notes. If it's not in the notes, you pretty much didn't say it. So there's so many claims that come through and it's like, um, the, the patient says, well, yeah, the doctor told me I had gum disease. I knew that, but they didn't tell me how bad it was. If I knew how bad it was, I would have seen a specialist. So it's those types of things. And, and I'm going to help you find ways of trying to reduce, obviously, your risk of litigation. Um, and then the second reason is failure to refer. And the key part of this is at an appropriate time. So not referring like when we really can't do much. I often have cases, I'm quite protective of my referrers. So whatever happens, I make sure they don't get into trouble. But even if they're referred when we really can't do that much, um, you know, it, it's not it's not a great, a great thing. We want to refer them at the right time. That's the key thing. Otherwise, what happens is the patient loses a tooth and then they complain and they say, right, um, doc, you're going to pay for my implant now. That's generally a really common story. And sometimes we think patients don't care um, uh, about their gum disease, but when they lose that tooth, when you have that negative life event, they suddenly um, care. So we're gonna go through things um, to do with this today anyway, um, to try and minimize our risk. But as, as you said, it is one of the top of the list in terms of, of litigation. So it's worth talking about this topic. So what we'll do today is I'll take you through your whole patient journey. Okay, so it's quite a lot, um, but all the, the things you really need to know in general practice for perio in more of a practical um, way. The only biology I'm gonna go through is this, which is a very basic etiology. Um, and really all I wanna say is that just be aware, obviously these periodontal conditions are inflammatory conditions. And the reason why I'm highlighting that is because that's how it links to general health. So the reason why it's been linked to diabetes, cardiovascular disease, um, Alzheimer's, because they're all inflammatory conditions. So it's important to just keep that at the back of your mind. And it's all about biofilms. Biofilms is the new buzzword, okay? It's no longer about, no one really uses the term plaque anymore. And it's all about the formation and persistence of biofilms. And when there's a, a, an imbalance, you get something called gingivitis. As you know, that's reversible. And if it's not controlled, you get periodontitis. And this balance between the host microbiome is literally the most important thing. Um, and when we look at the stats as to how the damage is actually caused, 80% of the tissue damage is actually caused by the host response, not the, the biofilm. And if you just think about this number for, for a second, 80% is huge. What that means is it's the small amount is to do with the biofilm, but the majority of the damage is actually due to the host. That's why I always say to my patients, gum disease is quite an unfair condition. 
right? Some people who clean their teeth really, really well um, uh, will get it because it, it's that they're more susceptible to it. And some people don't even brush their teeth, they don't get it. Why is that? It's because there's host susceptibility. So that's an important figure to keep at the back of your mind. And this whole response is modified by local and systemic risk factors. So that's what we're going to um, start off with. So let's pretend and let's dream we're back at work. I'm sure we're all, all missing it badly. Um, so you're in the chair, right? It's uh, Tuesday morning and your first patient comes in. This is John. Okay. He has perio. I know he doesn't look like he's got perio. Sometimes they don't look like they've got perio. Um, and he's sitting in your chair and um, in the notes, you've had a look. It's the first time you've seen the patient, but they've been at the practice for a little while. Um, you have a look in the notes and there's some uh, things in the notes which suggest he might be a perio patient. And um, or you look at the radiographs and you see that he's a perio patient. So in your history taking, which is the first thing you're going to do, what are some of the questions, if you use a chat box, that you might ask him to elicit this is a perio patient? What are some of the questions? Good, are you a smoker? Perfect. Anything before that? Diabetes, yeah. Think even before that, so your whole presenting complaint. Very good. Any bleeding on brushing, meds, yep. Mobility, perfect. Anything else? Family history, yep. Anything else? Bad, perfect, brilliant. Okay, that's it. So there are a few things that you should ask your patients, not wait for them to tell you. Because when I used to see um, patients for perio, I used to do a quick history and they never used to say anything. They used to just say, yeah, I'm fine. And then I put the um, chair back, do an exam, and there's like grade two mobile teeth everywhere, bleeding everywhere. Um, and I put the chair back up and I'm like, hold, are you sure, John, that you're not getting any um, bleeding when you're, when you're brushing? And like, oh yeah, I'm getting bleeding when I'm brushing, but that's just because I, I overbrush, right? And you're like, oh my God. And then, you, and then you say to them, what about them? Are you sure you're not getting any mobility? I, I noticed there's a, some teeth which are loose. And they're like, oh yeah, I guess there is a tooth that's loose. Oh, I guess, yeah, I'm having a bit of difficulty brushing on that side. I don't know why, but perio patients don't often say their presenting complaint. So I found it's better to actually have a few questions in your templates that you can actually ask them. That means that you can find out a little bit more, do your examination, and you then have time to explain the value of your treatment and they have more time to understand it and accept it. What doesn't work so well is that they tell you at the end when you're finishing off and you've got like two minutes to try and explain the value of your treatment, uh, obviously they're not going to accept or they're not going to accept going to the hygienist or whatever. So try and ask your patients um, some of these questions from the beginning. These seven questions are from the BSP, which they've advised to put in your templates. The ones I would um, suggest are the key ones is um, bleeding on, sorry, uh, whoops. The ones I suggest as the key ones are bleeding um, which you said, make sure you say bleeding on brushing, not just bleeding, otherwise they'll say it, it's not bleeding, um, loose teeth, um, and then uh, mobility, and also uh, bad taste. I, bad breath, people, I find that they're less um, uh, confident to admit it, it's a little bit more embarrassing, so I always say, oh, do you have a, a bit of a bad taste, um, and then they, they tend, to, uh, tend to admit it, so uh, I would go through those um, few questions in your history. Okay, so add them to your templates, essentially. Risk factors, then once you've done your complaining of, right, the next thing you obviously do is your medical history, social history, family history, all those types of things. So what's the biggest condition, well actually you've already said it, in your uh, medical history is diabetes. This is absolutely huge for your perio patients. So for perio patients, there's quite a few medical conditions that can obviously affect uh, the gums, but diabetes, I would say, is probably the biggest one. You all know what diabetes is, right? It's a metabolic disorder characterized by hyperglycemia. It is a global epidemic. Like perio, you're going to be seeing diabetics all the time, and it increases susceptibility and severity. And the, we call it a modifiable factor because although it can't be um, cured, it can be controlled. And control is the main thing uh, with these patients. So John has ticked that he's diabetes, he's diabetic, sorry. The next question you ask them, and uh, as Jenny and Matthew have already said, is are they well controlled? Are you aware of your blood sugar level? Now, instead of sugar level, what is the better measure of control? What's the better, if you, if you really wanted to find out, because in the past, right, I used to ask my patients who are diabetic, 
are you well controlled? And they all used to say yes. And I was thinking, gosh, I'm in like an area where like everyone's got really well controlled diabetes. And then I realized that they've just, everyone seems to say yes. So as you've all said, it's the HbA1c, which is the key thing to actually ask them. And that's a level of uh, long-term control over three months. Obviously you need to ask them the type of diabetes as well. So a couple of tips with these patients. So firstly, they may be at risk of hyperglycemia. So if you're doing extensive treatment like half mouth or you know, approach with RSD or even full mouth, you don't want to be seeing them at a time where there might be a risk of hypo. So book them straight after breakfast, straight after lunch. That's the first thing. The second thing is the control, which we've gone over. Um, you may not be aware that the um, units have now changed to millimoles per mole. So there used to be a percentage. It's now millimoles per mole. And around 48 to 50 is what you're after. Anything above that, they're not very well controlled. And it means this could have an impact on your um, care. It could mean that you need to see them more frequently. Um, but they need to be aware that if their control is not very good, your treatment is not going to be as good as you hoped, essentially. So make sure they're aware of it. Make sure you put it in the notes. In your treatment plan, you actually need to write discussion of um, importance of diabetes control that is a part of the treatment plan like you do smoking cessation like you do ohi that should be one of your um, treatment planning points and that's how important it is um, the fifth little tip is be a supporter now what i mean by this is patients with diabetes have so much to think about i'm sure you know at least one person with diabetes right can i eat this have i had my medication um have i been to my eye appointment have i been to my foot ulcer appointment there's literally so much they need to care about and plant control is just another one of those things so you have to try and rather than it's tempting to just be to them be uh, say to them you know what you haven't used your teepees why are you not using them and try and almost like uh, to tell them off about it but actually the best way to do it is you know what, John, I know you've got lots going on to think and uh, lots uh, to think about with your diabetes. How can we fit this into your regime? How can we make it work so that you're looking after your, your whole body, including your mouth? So try and work with them. And finally, with a good perio treatment, you can actually reduce this HbA1c by 0.4%. And this is a Cochrane review, so it's, it's, it's high quality evidence. Now, 0.4% do you think this sounds like a lot? Is that really significant? 0.4% in HbA1c? Would you say that's significant? What do you guys think? Say yes or no in the chat. I just want to get an idea. What do you think 0.4 long term will add up? Okay. Sounds low, but it is. Yes, no, yes. Okay, mixed bag. Yeah, okay, fine. I agree. So 0.4% um, doesn't sound like much, but it actually is huge. If you look at the stats, this is how much difference it makes. Um, in fact, 0.4% is equivalent to them adding another drug in their diabetes regime. So it's a bit like saying, oh, John, I'm aware that you've got diabetes and um, I know your GP was going to put you on metformin, but I'm not sure if you're aware, but with good gum treatment, we might actually be able to improve your HbA1c level equivalent to that metformin. You may not even need metformin. I mean, if you say that to a patient, that is hugely motivational. Not only that, but think about the side effects of drugs and the side effects of perio treatment, you know, drugs and long-term medication, you'd rather be having around a perio treatment. So again, if you need motivation, use these kind of stats. Um, in the same way, by the way, interestingly, the kind of latest evidence on this is, um, if you um, uh, so just uh, if you are healthy, right, and you get uh, perio, you now increase your risk of diabetes as well. So that general health thing can be related to anyone. Um, Isabel, so very risky to tell patient that patient. Yeah, you, no, I think it's a motivational tool. So obviously the, the GP needs to do what they need to do, but you can say to them by improving your gum health, we may actually be able to improve your glycemic control. At the end of the day, it's not the GP what they do, but that's used as a motivational tool. Often control is um, very much in the patient's control as well, i.e. diet, all those kind of things. So if you can use exercise, all those kind of things, if you can use this to try and motivate them as well as having perio treatment, um, it, can, it can work wonders really. But obviously the, the final um, decision is down to the GP, but good point. Um, other things in your medical um, uh, history that you might need to um, be aware of, that you might think, oh, this is a perio patient or I need to treat this patient slightly differently, things like immunodeficiency. 
So we're talking about HIV, AIDS, all those kind of things usually um, uh, cause necrotizing periodontitis. So that's the new term, by the way, in the new classification. It's not called acute necrotizing or ANUG. It's now just called necrotizing periodontitis. Now, you're probably not going to see this kind of textbook picture um, is less common now. And the reason why is because the medications are so well, they control the condition so well. Um, so normally it's very subtle. You see kind of like punched out papillae, very tiny amount, maybe a slight pseudomembrane, slight halitosis. So you have to be even more vigilant um, with these patients. And then also on your medical history, you're going to have things like pregnancy and pregnancy, you have hormonal changes. And what I say to the patient is that your gums become more sensitive. So before you could get away with not using those interdental brushes, but now if you don't do it, your gums are going to bleed. So you have to be even more vigilant and strict with your with their with their home care. And there's two things that can happen in pregnancy. You either get an edematous response, which is like you're probing and it's profusely bleeding, or um, you get your, your classic pregnancy epulis, which is your pluripotive response. Uh, and that's how um, uh, the body responds. These are really good resources um, for pregnant patients, also FAQs for ourselves um, and recommendations for people who are pregnant as well. And these are free to download. This is from the EFP website. So um, European Federation of Perio, they've got loads of free resources. They've even got like infographics, videos you can play in the waiting room, all those kind of things. So it's worth um, now that we've got some extra time to look at these kind of resources um, and maybe compile uh, things we can give to our patients. So have a look at that. But the key thing and the thing that they emphasize in this guidance is that treating pregnant patients is obviously safe. Um, but obviously some, some women are, are very worried about it. So you have to reassure them and you have to explain to them it's actually riskier to leave it than treat it. And it's, it's completely safe to treat period patients. The only thing you would probably avoid is surgery. Everything else just continue um, as you normally would. So have a look at those resources. And finally, on the medical history will be medications. So can anyone guess what am I talking about here? So I'm looking here at drug influence gingival enlargement, which is, by the way, is a new, the new classification. I'm going to go through it in a minute, but um, they've changed so many words. And, and now it's called drug influence gingival enlargement. That's a new term. Okay, so perfect cyphosporin, nifedipine, and phenytoin. Very good. You got them all. So um, these are the ones to look out for. Anything with a dipine at the end. Um, and it's quite common uh, nowadays. Not everyone who is on them will get it. Um, you get two groups of people, responders and non-responders. Um, but for anyone on these medications, I would look out for it. Um, usually the overgrowth begins classically in the interdental regions and then it essentially um, coalesces with the surrounding tissue. This here is bad news. Um, and the reason why it's bad news is you're not going to get a TP brush through that, right? And if you're not going to get a th TP brush through that, the, the ginger bee is going to overgrow, then it's going to be even harder to clean, then it's going to overgrow. So, I mean, this is not a good position to be in. You want to prevent it looking like that. This is why I'm saying be very, very vigilant. So if they're on this medication, actually look out for um, the overgrowth interdentally. And you might notice before I did my specialist training, I, I probably would have missed half these cases. You just notice it's slightly over becoming a little bit fibrous interdentally. When it starts looking like that, that's when you need to knuckle down on the home care so it doesn't get to this stage. At this stage, um, after you've done as, as much as you can, you need to refer this. This definitely needs um, uh, surgery. Um, so Isabel, uh, we'll go through your question at the end um, on referring because there's a whole section on that. And then Onka, um, how commonly do you see overgrowth? Yeah, it's actually becoming um, uh, more common. This presentation is rare this severity but it does happen obviously what i see is on the severe end of the spectrum um, but in practice i would say it depends on what area you're in and the demographics of the area but it's not uncommon uh, especially with more and more patients taking amlodipine it's interesting with amlodipine there seems to be a threshold with the medication when it turns from five milligrams to ten milligrams you see quite a big uh, change in the number of patients affected so um you can keep that at the, at the back of your mind uh, and it won't just grow back if it's treated. The key thing is plaque control. Once you've done some surgery and if they're excellent with their plaque control, even if the medication hasn't been changed, you can maintain it. Um, uh, and even if it does overgrow, it won't be to this extent. So you can just manage it non-surgically. So to keep a look out for these patients. So that's your medical history. The next one is um, family history. 
So family history, as we've also kind of alluded to, is quite important in Peru. In fact, 50% of susceptibility is due to genetic factors. It's probably more relevant to the, the type of, we don't, we don't call it aggressive anymore, but the types of aggressive cases, um, but it, is, uh, it does apply to all perio patients. Now, the problem with family history is the reliability of it, right? So if someone comes to you and they say, if John says to you, right, yeah, you know, my mom, um, she lost all her teeth when um, uh, she got married and she's like 70 now, um, I just think I've got weak gums and teeth. That probably isn't a positive family history. What is a positive family history is something like, oh yeah, my sister who's also 32 is seeing a specialist at the moment and they're having some surgery. That probably is a positive family history. So um, just be aware, take it with a pinch of salt really. So that's family history. And then we move on to social history. And like diabetes being the biggest factor in, social, um, uh, in medical history, in the social history, smoking is your by far your biggest, biggest risk factor. Um, so firstly, obviously, ask the patients if they smoke, get a good um, uh, uh, an idea of how many they smoke for how many years. Has it always been the same amount or has it been more before? Um, but it's bad news for perio patients. It increases the susceptibility. It increases the severity. Um, depending on how much they smoke, the, the worse it is. If you do treatment, it doesn't always work as well. It's very unpredictable. Even if it does work, it's more likely to relapse. So one thing we must, must do is um, enhance smoking cessation in, in our clinics. And you can do a very, very quick AAR. So ask, advise, refer. Ask them if they're interested in stopping. Obviously, if they say no, you don't then move on to give them advice because they're not in the right mindset, but you've, you've done your bit. But advise them if they're interested that it, it, it will be beneficial not just for their oral health but for their general health and if they're interested then to refer them for smoking cessation help and i always say to my patients if you're wondering whether to, tr to try and quit yourself or get some help for it i would always use the nhs um, stop smoking services because it triples your odds of stopping successfully that's a huge number so i would always quote that to the patient as well it's free as well so it's the services to use of course, everyone has a choice in life. And if they want to continue to smoke, that is totally fine. It's completely up to them. But you've got to warn them of the risk of um, uh, uh, suboptimal treatment, the risk of recurrence, um, and you need to put it in your notes. Basically, you just cover yourself. So what about vaping is probably your next question. And vaping is extremely common. One in five of your smokers will vape. So I've just updated my medical history where it says, do you smoke? I've got another little line saying, um, do you vape? I think it'd be a good thing to do to update our medical history forms. But anyway, ask them, do they vape? It's harder to get a um, proper kind of uh, history from it. So, you know, you can't really ask how many, uh, how much do you, you have to ask them, how many cigarettes do you get through? How many vape uh, liquid cartridges do you get through? What milligrams of nicotine is in it? They're all the ways of trying to um, get a, a better history, but it's tricky with vapors. Um, there are different types of vapes as well. Um, I did my uh, dissertation on this, so I know a fair amount on, on vaping. And there's three generations. So first generation is kind of obsolete. Second generation is fairly common. If you're super cool, you've got the third generation. Um, and there's like 5,000 flavors and different types. And the reason why I'm including this slide is to just to say to you, the reason why we don't know so much about vaping is because there's so many brands, so many different types out there. It's actually very, very difficult to do good studies on them. So what do we say to our patients? Well, what we do know from the evidence that's out there is that it's meant to be better for your general health. Quite honestly, I keep seeing reports though, random reports saying it gives you this problem, that problem. So I'm not really sure, but overall, this uh, document that came out of the Royal College of Physicians is that it's better for your general health. It does help smokers quit, because if you think about it, it's the only smoking cessation tool which mimics kind of smoking. Um, the patches don't do that. The chewing gum don't do that. This is the only one. So it makes sense. It helps people stop, but we don't really know how it affects the mouth, let alone the gums. So my take on this is I say to my patient, OK, so, John, you said you're vaping. Um, are you using it to help you stop smoking? If you are, that's great. Um, uh, but long term, we want to also make sure you stop vaping as well. And then you put vaping cessation on your treatment plan as well. So it, it is it's going to likely have some effect. So that's vaping. Um, the other things in the social history might not be so apparent, but it's still quite important, are things like stress. So negative life events, 
COVID. I'm really worried about all my peri patients. They're going to they're going to have some serious problems due to the stress of COVID. But stress has a major impact. Um, in terms of mechanisms, it's likely to be obviously an immune response because of stress, but also a behavioral change as well. For example, if you've got someone going through a divorce or moving house, they're not going to be that doing their interdental brushes is not going to be their priority, right? So behaviorally, things will change as well. And I see this all the time, actually, patients who we've had at the clinic on maintenance for like five, six years, and then suddenly they become really super healthy for that long, very well maintained, and then suddenly um they just relapse i did the pocket chart put the chair up and i say has anything changed your oral hygiene is really good um everything else is is, is does everything else the same as everything and then they'll say to me oh rena i'm going through a divorce i'm moving house or this happened to my daughter or she didn't get into university you know all these stress um it massively affects it affects your gums and especially patients who are susceptible so I always say to my patients, stress has a major impact. It's difficult to control it, um, but it's just good to know that the gums will be their weak spot. If something happens in the body, it's going to show up on their gums. So keep stress at the back of your mind um, in terms of history taking. And then finally, you have your um, dental history and just a, a good amount of nutrition. So there are specific things like calcium, vitamin D, vitamin C, um, magnesium, there's various amino acids. All these things do uh, help with periodontal condition, but I don't think there's enough evidence to suggest that, you know what, John, you need to take some um, vitamin C. I think just say, you know, as long as you have a good amount of fruit and veg, you're good, um, you'll be fine. Think about, and the way, I mean, it makes sense because think about the periodontal um, tissues, it's made up of collagen, the periodontal ligament, all of that, it needs renewing and that's how it does it is, is through nutrition. So we haven't even picked up our probe yet. John is still sitting in the chair um, and we've managed to get all of this information out of them, which will make us think, oh, this is a perio patient or they're at risk of perio. Or if they ha do have this condition or some of these things, we might need to approach this slightly differently. Um, so let's just have a look, quick look at come any um, uh, points on the chat. So I know um, it's more like insufficient um, no, so, Anil, there is evidence, that the, the things I've said, there's good evidence for it, i.e. it helps you to stop smoking and it's meant to be better for your general health. But I'd rather take a um, worst case scenario approach, so I'd always put vaping cessation in the, um, hit, uh, in the advice. I don't think we should recommend continuing to vape or anything like that, but vaping cessation is a, is a key uh, part of your treatment plan. Um, obesity, Jenny, you are right. Obesity is actually um, a risk factor for perio. Uh, we don't know the mechanisms. The reason why I didn't include it in here is I'm not sure people feel comfortable um, with saying, uh, with giving weight advice to their patients. Interestingly, there was a whole perio conference on this and everyone was asked to put up their hands as to whether they would give weight advice. Um, and half the people said they would. I didn't put my hand up. I just felt a bit like, oh, I'm not sure I would say to your patient, you need to lose weight. But it does make sense because we give diet advice. We give smoking cessation advice. Maybe this is a, another thing that will come um, onto the clinic, but let's see. But obesity is um, has been shown to be a risk factor. Alcohol intake is is not really by itself a risk factor. Um, just but smoking is and clenching or grinding occlusal factors can have a. That's more to do with de like actual dental factors. But yes, they can have a role as well. Very good. Okay, so we've done the um, history taking. We're now going to put the chair back. Okay, and what is the first thing um, you're going to do in terms of perio examination? What is the first thing that should be at the, the top of your um, list? Perfect, brilliant, okay. And I know this is um, uh, uh, kind of, uh, as well as visual inspection, which is right, and then it's also your BPE. And I know this is so obvious, right? But the number of medical legal cases that we see that patients um, and the dentist or the hygienist have missed out doing a BPE, or they've just copied the numbers before, it, it's huge. Um, so do not ever get lazy with your BP. It doesn't take very long and it will honestly save you a lot of stress if anything does happen. So we all know how to do the BP and you all know what it all means. Um, start from the age of seven. Okay, so from, from children as well, where you're using a simplified BP code zero, one and two. Now, a few years ago, um, the BSP updated the BP. Um, so I just want to go through six of the changes that were um, made. Um, just in, I'm sure you all know this already, but just in case. Um, so there were six changes. The first one is if you get a code four um, in one of the sextant, you need to continue to examine all the sextants, uh, all the teeth, sorry, in that sextant. So for example, you've got this upper seven here, right? Say you were probing this 
and you got a, a very deep pocket, which meant which meant your BPE code was four. And then you were like, oh, that's the highest number. Let's move on to the anterior sextant. You would have missed this upper right six, which has a furcation, exactly. So you would have got the wrong code. It's actually four star, not four. Does that make sense? So the key thing is not just probing a couple of teeth, you're probing around the full um, dentition. The second thing that was changed was um, if you get a code three, you're not meant to jump in and do a pocket chart straight away. You're meant to do something called initial risk factor control. What that means is anything the patient can do to improve the perio themselves, i.e. oral hygiene instructions, super scale, uh, scale gross scale, um, uh, smoking cessation, um, advice on diabetes, anything that they, that's, they can do in terms of risk factor control. Then you close off your course of treatment, get them back eight to 12 weeks later, open another band of treatment, um, another course of treatment, sorry. If it's still a code three, then you um, redo your, um, uh, you then do your pocket chart at that stage, and then you do your um, RSD. You don't jump in and do RSD straight away. So that was an extra little step. And the reason why is, to be honest, if you do that, patients who only have like four or five millimeter pockets can often control it just with um, uh, OHI. So it, it means you need to do less treatment, basically. The third change was, um, or it was not really a change, it was a point that BP should not be used around implants. Um, hopefully you don't see too many patients like this, but the tissues around implants are obviously different to that around teeth. So a BP score doesn't really apply. What is better and what is recommended is a four or six point pocket chart. Um, and, and probing is, is really important. Um, the fourth thing was you do need to take appropriate radiographs. This is going to become even more apparent when we do um, the new classification because the importance of having good radiographs are critical for getting an actual diagnosis. The way I would see, say to you, and the way I would see it, and, and what I would say to you is always ask yourself, can I see the bone everywhere? Right? If you can see the bone crest and there is nothing else going on, you're fine. You can use bite wing, you can use whatever view you have. If you cannot see the bone, right and it's even if it's just the distal of that upper seven and the bone you can't see where it finishes take a pa because if you find out later down the line that's got 90 percent bone loss it's going to change your treatment plans can change the prognosis the patient's going to be annoyed if they end up needing it out and had no idea that the tooth had a guarded prognosis so always ask yourself can i see the bone you don't necessarily have to have pas for all the teeth i just don't think you have time for that um you'll come to find i'm quite a lenient periodontist i don't i am quite slightly different to what some of the other periodontists will say in, in terms of things like this, but I just don't think you have time to do full mouth PAs in practice. That Kate patient then sh sh either should be referred um, or you, you need it to, to get them back, but you don't, you don't re you ideally want to get away with um, all you need. I, if bite wings are good, then, then go with the bite wings. Um, the fifth, uh, and for, yeah, vertical bite wings are great as well. Thank you. Um, did you? Uh, so uh, change five was you only need to record four millimeters and above on your pocket chart. That might possibly save you some time. Um, and you always need to record bleeding. Bleeding is a, a key sign of how active the condition is. If you don't record bleeding, you don't know the level of activity. So always include that. So once you've done your BP, this might then um, push you to do a six point pocket chart if indicated. And just to say here, a pocket chart is more than just probing depth. Um, don't forget to include recession if it's severe mobility and furcation, especially if it's grade two and above. Um, I mean, you can get away with missing out grade, um, grade one mobility and get away sometimes missing out like one zero to one millimeter recession. You might just want to put a general statement in your notes. But when you've missed out like a seven millimeter recession defect or a grade three furcation involvement or grade two uh, mobility, that's not good. That, that's, you need that recorded because that's going to change your prognosis. That's going to change your treatment plan. So remember, it's more than just um, probing depth. Fine, so you've done your um, examination. The next thing you obviously do are your special investigations. So the first thing is obviously radiographs, which we've already gone through. Um, and as we said, there are a few options here. Your gold standard is your PA, but it's not always needed. With your radiographs, it's also not just about bone loss. There's a lot more to the story. So have a look at other things. Have a look at the anatomy, for example. Are the roots long and tapered or are they short and conical? That makes a big difference in terms of their long-term outlook. Think about anchorage. Even if they both have 50% bone loss, the one with the nice long tapered roots is going to have a far better prognosis than the one with the, the short conical roots. So look at anatomy, look at local factors, look at overhangs, deficient margins, evidence of calculus, any PA areas, all those kinds of things. It's not just about the um, bone loss. 
And in terms of how often you take um, uh, radiographs, well, it's not like caries where you've got like caries risk and it's every six months or, or whatever is indicated. Radiographs in perio patients don't get outdated very quickly. So unless something's changed, like the tooth is, uh, the probing depth has increased um, significantly, it's symptomatic. If you've got a radiograph that's only a couple of years old, that's fine. You've got to ask yourself, if I take this radiograph, will it change what I do? If it will, and it will, if it will influence your treatment plan, then take it. If it won't, then what, what's the need uh, of taking a, a radiograph? Um, and in terms of reading radiographs, it's just a, a kind of side tip, which um, someone showed me, which I found really helpful. When you're reading radiographs, try and read them in the same direction every time. So um, here I would start off um, coronally to apically. So I'd start off at the top and then you'd comment on anything coronal. So you talk about any caries, talk about any deficient margins. Um, you could work your way down. Then you talk about any um, overhangs, any evidence of calculus. You could comment on the um, root canal treatment here. Then you'd work your way down, talk about the bone loss, the pattern, the amount, work your way down. Uh, there's a, PA, uh, there's a um, radiolucency around the um, root here evidence of furcation involvement, work your way down. Um, there's a file sticking out there and there's a PA area. So I always find reading, not just for perio, radiographs in general in the same direction means you don't miss anything. Otherwise what happens, you just stare at the most obvious thing and sometimes things get missed out. So it's just as a side point, when you are reading these radiographs, the, the best way to try and take into account everything, not just the bone loss, is by reading them uh, in the same direction every time. In terms of other special investigations, sensibility testing, um, which is the right word rather than vitality testing, is important to do, for example, in grade three furcations, um, grade three mobile teeth, any symptomatic teeth. Usually you can get away with endofrost. If you do have an electric pop tester, even better, but use what you have um, in practice. Here you're thinking about things like perioendo, um, or it's now called, annoyingly in the new classification, it's called endopero. It's, it's really stupid. They've changed the, um, for some reason, they've changed the, the order of it. But anyway, you, you can call it, you'd, get, you'd be fine calling it periendo, but it's actually now called endopero. But anyway, this is what you're picking up through um, sensibility testing. Okay, so let me just have a quick look at the questions before we move on to diagnosis. Um, probing implant at every exam. Yes, uh, just like basically do it every time you do a BP, probe the implant, 100%. The key thing you're looking for um, in terms of implants, uh, and I will go through this um, later on, is an increase in probing depth. So I'll go through this in a minute, but you'll, you need a measurement to compare against, um, otherwise you won't know what's happening around that implant. So you do need to do it every single time, not just uh, kind of one-off. Okay, everyone's still here, right? Good, so we'll move on to the uh, diagnosis now. And, um, you're probably thinking, oh my God, why did they um, update the, the classification? I just about got my head around this and now they've got another thing I need to get my head around. Um, you know, everyone's a, a bit unhappy about the new classification. So honestly, it's not too bad. I wanna, in about 10 minutes, make sure it's super clear in your head. Um, so make sure you're all kind of um, full focus for this section. I'm just gonna simplify it. So first thing to say is for the new classification, um, how it all happened, was there were a group of European periodontists and a group of American periodontists. And two years ago, they all went to, uh, off to the States and had a meeting and decided they needed to update the classification. They were like, it's been two decades, everything's outdated, let's make a new classification. Fair enough, because things have changed. So they created this new classification and they published it in 2018. And slowly um, but surely, people in the UK found it very, very difficult to implement. Um, some of you, uh, may have already seen the original um, uh, version. It's really confusing. Like, re and it's, it's asking you to do things like full mouth recession, like a lot for the time you have in practice. So after that, a group of us got together, a group of British periodontists got together, and we then decided to simplify it. Um, and that was launched, simplification was launched in the BDJ in 2019, uh, in Jan. So the first thing to say is there are two versions. There's a original version and then there's a simplified version. You only need to know the simplified version, okay, which is super straightforward, which I'm going to show you. So just be a little bit careful. I know everyone's um, watching webinars and reading extra stuff um, during this time we have at home. But if you're, do it, you're reading about the new classification, just make sure you're reading about the right thing. You're reading about the BSP, the UK version, not the European version. 
the thing that um, the, the, and the part that they've um, essentially simplified, which is the, the, uh, in the British version, is this section. So this table remains the same. There's still two major categories of disease. There's periodontal diseases and then there's peri-implant diseases. That's straightforward. But it's within this part um, that the BSP decided to simplify it. And then this is the paper that we uh, wrote in Jan 2019. Um, if you can't get hold of these papers, you're going to have my contact details at the end. I can um, send you resources and so on. But to be honest, I'm going to go through uh, what you need to know anyway now. So the first thing is, under the category of periodontal diseases and conditions, there are now three different types, three subcategories. So you've got periodontal health, the gingival diseases and condition as one. Then you've got periodontitis as a second. And then you've got other conditions affecting the periodontium. So if we start off with periodontal health, gingival diseases and conditions, the first thing um, to say here is that it's the first time that they've included periodontal health. Before, we didn't actually have a definition for periodontal health. And the only thing you need to know about health is really straightforward. Three millimeters and below, probing depths are healthy. Um, in terms of bleeding score for the whole mouth, less than 10% is healthy. Now, what this doesn't mean is if you probe a site and it's bleeding, it's healthy. It's not, there's something going on there. But on a patient by patient basis, i.e. the whole mouth, as long as it's less than 10%, you can call that patient healthy. The reason why is if you had, if you put, if we, if we made it 0%, no one, would, everyone would be unhealthy. So there needs to be, there's some level of tolerance there, essentially. So that's the first thing. The one you really need to know inside out is this category. So now there's only three types of periodontitis. There's necrotizing, which we've already mentioned. There's periodontitis. It's just called periodontitis. No chronic, no aggressive. It's literally just called periodontitis. And then there's a third one, which is periodontitis as a manifestation of systemic disease. And obviously from that, the one you're going to need to know is this one, periodontitis. So this is where everyone gets confused and then um, uh, gets uh, annoyed about the classification. Some of you may have seen the flow charts that were released by the BSP. They're great. Uh, but even though I was involved in creating them, I still think they take up too much time in practice. You need something which is like takes you 20, 30 seconds. So I broke it down a little bit further into six steps. And honestly, if you just follow, this is what I use. This is what I've talked to my referrers and they, they do it really quickly. Um, as long as you follow this, um, you'll be absolutely fine. So I just want to spend a minute or so on these six steps. So step one is determine the type of periodontal disease. Now, what I mean by that is you're looking at the radiographs and you're seeing, is there any bone loss? Because bone loss is your key sign that someone's got periodontitis. Okay, and by the radiographs, I mean anything that you've taken or anything that is in the notes, whatever you have available, you don't necessarily need to have full mouth PA, whatever's clinically justified. So you look at step one, look at the radiographs. Is there bone loss? If there is, you ask yourself, is it due to perio? Now, the reason why I'm saying that is because not all bone loss is due to perio, right? Can anyone tell me what are the other reasons you can get bone loss? Any specific conditions or... Yeah, all of them are correct. So um, all, yeah, all of extractions, especially like impacted aids, if you're taking out an impacted aid, you're gonna have to remove bone. So just check, is this bone loss due to perio? It probably is. If it is, you get a tick and you've got your first step, which is this is a periodontitis patient. So you've got the label of periodontitis. Doesn't matter if they're active or not active, they are a periodontitis patient. Easy. Next step, still looking at the radiographs, you talk about the disease extent. So is the bone loss affecting up to 30% of teeth, i.e. is it localized? Is it affecting more than 30% of teeth, i.e. is it generalized? Or this is a kind of new category, is it just affecting the first molars and the incisors? And if it is, there's this new thing called molar incisor pattern. So if we have a look at the case on the left, this is definitely a periodontitis patient, step one. And step two, this is definitely generalized bone loss. Easy, that's step one and two done. The third step is your staging, okay? And staging is all about severity. So you're still looking at the radiograph. So what you do now is you pick the worst tooth. So in this patient, clearly the upper right five is your most severe bone loss. And then you just focus on that one tooth, forget everything else. As long as that bone loss is due to perio, you've got to pick that worst case scenario. So what this means is if you've got one tooth with 90% bone loss due to perio and the rest of the mouth has 10% bone loss, you've got to go with that worst case scenario, okay? As long as it's due to perio. And then what you do is you um, stage it. So Beata, you are on fire, stage four, very good. Okay, 
so you, ju you jump the uh, steps but essentially with staging is stage one two three and four so what you do is you divide the root up into thirds stage one is like the tiniest amount of bonals i would just focus on stage two three and four so you divide the root up coronal third mid third apical third so it's stage two three four easy so as this one's in the apical third it's stage four okay so that's straightforward then with grading, all you now need to do is take into account the patient's age because the patient's susceptibility is how you get your grade. So, okay, I've got 90% bone loss here. How quickly did this bone loss happen, right? So how quickly um, in my um, patient did this happen? If it's happened very quickly, they're obviously more um, susceptible. So staging was one, two, three, and four, and grading is A, B, C. So the quickest way of doing this, there is a, a calculation you can do, but the quickest way of doing this is asking yourself, is the bone loss more than my patient's age? If it is, right, then your grade C, because that patient is susceptible. The, the bone loss is more than my patient's age. So you've got a 50 year old with 70% bone loss, they are susceptible, they're grade C. If they don't say if that, that question is not correct, then you ask yourself, is the bone loss less than half my patient's age? right? So if it's less than half my patient's age, they're not that susceptible. You've got a 50 year old with 10% bone loss, not that susceptible. So that's grade A and anything in between is grade B. So if our patient here was um, 50, they've got 90% bone loss, they're obviously grade C. So that's kind of the quickest way of doing it rather than having to do the long winded um, calculation. Okay, um, step five is current disease status. So step one, two, three, and four all we did was um, uh, all we did was literally look at the radiographs. Okay, so remember this is all about radiographs. Then we've got to know what we're actually doing because we don't treat bone loss, we treat pockets. So now we need to know what are we actually working with. So this is when you look at your pocket charts, and here you have three options. You either have um, a stable patient, so they're healthy individuals. You either have disease remission or unstable. Now the difference between disease remission and unstable is remission is when there's just more than 10% bleeding. There aren't any deep pockets and unstable is when it turns into any open pocket. So this uh, brings me on to just as a side point, it's really good when you're speaking to your patients to use the terms open and closed pockets. Um, because in the past I used to use like millimeters and seven millimeter, eight millimeters. They don't really understand that. So try and use open and closed. So if you've got an open pocket, that's any uh, pocket that needs treatment for with bleeding or five and above and a closed pocket is anything that doesn't need treatment for without bleeding after treatment or um, uh, uh, form um, below. Um, so, or three and below, sorry. So open and closed um, is uh, the better term to use rather than the actual uh, millimeters. Um, so that's your um, fifth step. The sixth, so here, obviously, if we go back, look at this patient, this is obviously an unstable patient. And then your final step is your risk factor profile. So here um, uh, is where you take into account the two biggest risk factors, which now you know is diabetes and smoking. Now, obviously, all the other risk factors that we spent some time on are important to include right, in your notes, but you don't need to include it in what, your, what you call your diagnostic statement, only diabetes and smoking. The reason why that we've included these is they can be measured and controlled. So if uh, we have a look at this patient that we've just looked at, they would be a generalized periodontitis patient, stage four, grade C, currently unstable, risk factor smoking. So this is how it would look in your notes. So I would um, update your template so you've got it to make it easier um, for yourself. So let's just go through um, another case to make sure you've got it. This one we've already done. So just to remind you, 49 year old smoker, history of periodontal treatment. You saw the pocket chart just now um, and you've seen the, the full mouth PAs. Okay, so here we said, number one, is a superior patient? Yes, so it's periodontitis. Number two, is a bone loss localized or generalized? It's clearly generalized. Number three, pick the worst two, so we pick the upright five. It's in the uh, apical third, so it's stage four. The patient was 49, it's more than her age, so she's grade C. Looked at the pocket chart, unstable, any risk factors, smoker. So that literally took me like um, 20 seconds. If no risk factors are present, you just write NA, okay? So I want you guys to do this one, okay? So case two, you've got a 37 year old, medically fit and well, never smoker, family history of period. This is how she looks, you know, it's often not that obvious. Okay, and then this is the BPE, got some fours, which triggered a full um, uh, pocket chart. And these are her radiographs. So um, 
I would probably focus on the PAs because it's a little bit more clearer. Okay, step one, is this a periodontitis patient? Uh, you could just uh, um, type in the chat. Yep, good. Okay, good. Yes, it's a periodontitis patient. Step two, is the bone loss generalized or localized? This is a bit more gray, um, but looking at the PAs, would you say, yeah, it's localized, good. Um, and step three, pick the worst tooth. Which is the worst tooth? Yep, lower left six. Is the bone loss in the coronal, mid, or apical third? Mid, so that's stage two, three, or four? Three, perfect. The patient is 37. Is the bone loss more than her age? If so, which grade is she? A, B, or C? Perfect, and then looking at the pocket chart, is she stable, unstable, or in remission? Perfect, clearly unstable. And are, okay, be careful with this one now. Are there any risk factors? Remember we, what the ones that we need to include. Are there any relevant lifestyle risk factors? Okay, so you only include smoking and diabetes. So you put NA here because there aren't any. In your notes, you can then put family history and all the other things you've said, but you only, as part of your diagnostic statement, include um, uh, diabetes and, and, and smoking. Good. So I hope that makes it um, helpful. Um, in terms of the biotype, not in terms of your actual, um, uh, um, in terms of your diagnostic statement, it wouldn't have an influence, but in terms of your um, just general examination, it is good to include whether they're a, th a thick, um, they now call it phenotype, is another thing that they updated in the classification. It's no longer called biotype, it's called phenotype. It's, in it's important, Mara, as you said, to include um, thick phenotype or thin phenotype. So that's a really good point. I mean, if you can do that, it's not essential, but it's good practice to include that. So that's a good point. So we've done the diagnosis. Hopefully that helps break it down. Um, if you go onto my Instagram, there's lots of videos on this. Um, so it's RW Perry. You'll see like a whiteboard Wednesday video on the new classification. I've done quite a lot on it. So if, you're, if you are still confused, let me know. But hopefully the six steps breaks it down. After you've done your diagnosis, prognosis is an absolutely critical part of your notes especially medical legally. I'm sorry I keep going on about medical legal stuff, but it's so important and I want you, none of you to get into trouble. So prognosis is you're talking about the outlook for the teeth. And even if you just write in your notes a general statement, like all molars have guided prognosis, or even if you just wrote all, if genuinely all teeth have guided prognosis, you've covered yourself. What isn't acceptable is not writing anything and then something happens to a tooth and the patient's like, you didn't tell me that I might lose this tooth in the future. So I would in fact update your templates with a sentence or two saying, whatever teeth have guided prognosis, patient warned of tooth loss. So it, it's, 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 you don't have to do, I, ha, I do tooth by tooth prognosis because I'm in a specialist practice and I, I, that's the level of care I need to give. But in general practice, you, you do not have to do that. It's, it will take you forever. So give a general statement um, and let your patient know about prognosis. And then we put everything together and have a discussion with the patient. Now, when I started my specialist training, I used to get like, I'm still enthusiastic, but I was like ridiculously enthusiastic about getting probing depths of like eight millimeters down to four millimeters and this and that. And the patient just, they weren't getting excited. I was like, come on, like, I'm, I'm going to get your pockets down. And I thought, you know what? They're not interested in this clinical information. The clinical information is for me. What they're interested in is things like keeping their teeth for longer, not having to wear dentures, not suffering from a bad taste or bad breath not having blood on the pillow when they wake up. So one thing I would say to you, again, communication is everything in perio. Some, sometimes it's the way we say things which will determine how motivated they are. So, okay, the clinical information is useful for you. Then translate it to whatever they care about. That's going to make them accept your treatment. That's going to make them accept referral to the hygienist or the specialist. So um, translate it, essentially. So um, we've already touched on this, but whilst we're on the topic of examination and diagnosing, um, we've already kind of said this, but for implants, it's the same thing as, as, as perio patients. Assess OH, look at the condition of the tissues, always probe, you can use any probe you like, make a note of bleeding and suppuration. As we said, you're looking for an increasing probing depth. Take a radiograph, I think there was a question earlier on radiographs. Take one when you first see them, um, if you can get a hold of radiographs as to when the implant was placed, try and uh, do that. Um, uh, and, then, uh, and then depending on how uh, the clinical signs, if there's any changes like the probing depth increases, you might then need an, uh, an updated one. 
Um, if you do find a problem, um, then um, you need to make a provisional diagnosis of either peri-implant mucositis, peri-implantitis. So if you're not sure, just write peri-implant disease. And then if it's not within your scope, either refer it back to the person who placed it or refer it onto a specialist who can manage it. So I, I see quite a lot of peri-implant titus cases where we have to do surgery. Unfortunately, it's not that predictable to treat. You can only really slow down the progression. So I wouldn't give them any kind of false hope. I would just say we want to try and improve the situation. Um, you may lose this implant in the future, um, but it, it, it's, it's not as easy to treat as periodontitis. Um, and the thing is, you don't really have time with these patients. With periodontitis, it's a slow progression usually. With peri-implantitis, the patient can come back in a few weeks with the implant in their hand. Remember, there's no grade one, two, three mobility of implants. It's either osseointegrated integrated or it's not. So um, be very, very careful to examine implants uh, well. Um, so now moving on to treatment planning. So just have a quick look at the chat. Does the age of the implant affect the probing depth? Uh, no, it shouldn't. Um, uh, it should, you, either, you ideally want it to, wherever it is at baseline, whether that's six millimeters, it doesn't matter. It needs to try and remain consistent. It's when it increases, there's a problem. Um, yeah, so um, good question. If you're probing implants and not recording them as part of the BP, um, you can either write it in the notes uh, or, you know, in like the BP section, if you're on SOE, there's a notes section and that you can do it there. So you can easily refer to it or you can open up a six point pocket chart and just uh, chart that implant. Um, so wherever, as long as you would, I try not to do it within the actual notes because it's actually hard to um, uh, find it or for someone else to find it. Um, so... My, yeah, I mean, if you have a chance to do tooth by tooth prognosis, um, that's fantastic. And actually that idea of printing out the pocket chart and then highlighting, I mean, if you can do that, that's brilliant. I'm giving you like the minimum here, um, but obviously we want everyone at Together Dental to be amazing. So if you can do that, um, that's, that's obviously fantastic. Okay, moving on to the um, treatment plan. Okay, uh, Onka, I'll get to your question when we do OHI in, in a minute. So treatment planning is super important for perio patients, as Moya has just alluded to. Um, spending time on planning is, um, it, it will save you a lot of time and stress later. So especially for severe cases. Now I did my specialist training at Guy's, so I slowly saw the shard being built. So I was reading up quite a lot about it. And there was one article which said when they did this project, they only made 13 changes, which is like nothing for such a big building project. And the reason why is because they spent 60% of the time planning. Um, so always spend that time planning rather than just jumping into doing RSD straight away. Also, I don't know if you know, but the shard is still half empty. Um, Dental Protection have actually moved the shard because the, the rent is, has been reduced. Um, but what they said in the article as well is that the shard it should have really been built on the other side of the river, which, every, which things are booming on the other side. So <laughs> the point I'm trying to make here is take a step back and look at the bigger picture with these patients because it's often the other things, not just what's in the mouth, that will affect your success. For example, right, if you've got a working uh, mum with five children, if you say to her, and you didn't know about her social life, you said, if you said to her, you know what, um, Mrs. Smith, you have to do your interdentals first thing in the morning, she's not going to do them. If you said to her, you know what, I know you've got so many children, you've got to drop them off to school, why don't you do the interdentals when you get back from work, when you've got some more time? That way, she's more likely to do it, right, because you've got to know her, her regime. So, First thing is, as we said, the importance of treatment planning. If you can do tooth by tooth prognosis, this is where this comes into play, but also look at the long-term outlook for your patient. Are they gonna lose any teeth? If there are teeth which they might lose, how are you gonna replace them? You can't do implants straight away, especially not when you've got active peru. How else are you gonna replace them? Tooth by tooth prognosis, all those kind of things. When are you gonna refer? Do you need to plant the seed of referral at the beginning? So they're more accepting when, you, when they do definitely need referral. Um, all those types of things. And then taking a step back and then considering the whole patient holistically. Um, so when we do go into treatment, the first thing we always do is OHI. Now, I'm not gonna ask you how long you spend on OHI, but I've asked quite a few of my referrers and um, sometimes it's like three seconds, which is brush your teeth and something a little bit longer, um, but you don't probably have more than, I would say uh, five minutes in practice um, when you're working on the NHS. So I'm not gonna sit here and say, guys, you need to spend like half an hour doing OHI, it's not realistic. But what can you do in those five, 10 minutes to make it effective? So I'm gonna give you just uh, a couple of things um, which may help. The first thing is to orientate your patient. Now, often we think it's obvious as to what we're talking about when, we think it, when we're saying to them 45 degrees, modified bass, 
um, along the gum line. But honestly, sometimes you think patients are understanding what you're saying, but they don't. They have no idea where the gum line is, let alone what 45 degrees to the gum line is. So the first thing I would say, the quickest way to do this, get a mirror, pull the lower lip back, get a probe, show them um, in the mouth. This is the tooth. This is the gum. This is where the gum line is. And then put the probe into the gingival sulcus and say, look, see where this probe is disappearing? That's where all the bacteria is getting trapped. That's why we need to angle your tooth bristles in this direction rather than going on about 45 degrees, show them uh, in their mouth. And as you've quite rightly said, um, uh, we will talk about demonstrating in a minute, uh, Laura, Janet and Isabel, but the, the key thing is to orientate them first. Just tell them what, where they are in the mouth. You know, use radiographs, say to them, this is the tooth, this is the bone, this is where these, these little bumpy bits, that's the bacteria underneath your gum. That's what we're trying to clean. So if we're going to use floss here, it's going to go straight up and down. What we need to use is nice big interdental brushes, which are going to fit into those gaps and really clean those areas. And then they'll say to you, but you know what, doctor, I don't want to use the brushes. They're going to cause gaps between my teeth. Um, and um, uh, th then you say to them, well, actually, you know, the gap's already there. You can see the big black bit, the bone's already been lost. Um, but um, what we're going to try to do with oral hygiene is we're going to, the gums will tighten up as they become healthier. Yes, you will see the gaps, but the gaps are already there. Um, so that's a good thing to, to do. Um, so you orientate them. If you have time, disclose, but if you don't have time, at least get a plaque score and you can do this visually. You can use your probe to actually see where the, the plaque is. I would say, again, medical legally, you need a rough plaque score. Just saying OH, good, fair, poor, it's not very objective because what you think is good could be different to what someone else thinks is good, right? So try and get, even if you just put a rough percentage, like more than 80% plaque, less than 10% plaque, just get a rough, rough score. Um, as you, some of you have already said, demonstrate. I'm not a massive fan of models. Um, uh, guys, uh, Janet, I know you're saying about um, this webinar is recorded, so um, I'll share the recording. More than welcome to show the nurses as well. That'd be, um, you know, uh, great if, if some of them are trained to, to do this as well. But anyway, um, demonstrate the test drive is amazing. If you don't have the test drive in your practice, let me know. I can organize it um, to get you a test drive for the practice, but demonstrate in their mouth. Models are, are not very useful at all. They need to be able to feel the, uh, of how it should feel. So um, always promote, um, uh, as well as um, electric toothbrushes, always promote interdentals. Someone's already said single tufted are amazing. I use them for all my patients. Um, uh, so demonstrate that in the mouth. My particular favorite is uh, Oral-B, just because the reason why I like it is the, the shape of the head. It's round. Whereas with the Philips, it's, it, it doesn't work as well um, for the gums, essentially. Um, on my website, um, which you're more than welcome to use, uh, I've just recorded a few videos where um, I'm demonstrating, and these are my teeth. Um, I, I recorded myself demonstrating the, yes, I can get yellow in there, um, uh, demonstrate that. So if you want to direct them to the, it's just a YouTube link, you can feel free to use the resources um, as well. Uh, and there's one on a single tufted. I think I've got um, Kerry starting up on my six and excuse the plaque. But anyway, because sometimes it's hard for them to imagine and they can go back home and watch the video as well, which is, is quite helpful. So um, feel free to use that. Um, and then finally, when you're doing OHI, um, finish off with something called GPS. Now what this is, okay, so if you just say to your patient, you need to improve your brushing, right? They're just gonna come back and it's gonna be the same old story. You need to give them goals. So say to them, GPS is goal setting, planning, self-monitoring. It's an evidence-based way of changing behavior. So you would say, right, John, you've got 80% plaque today. Let's get you down to 40% just by focusing on your brushing. Okay. By next time, I want you down to 40%. Just go through what we've shown you. I'm going to give you these disclosing tablets. I haven't had time to use them today, but what you need to do, use them once a week, brush your teeth really well, then use the disclosing tablet. Wherever you're missing, go back and clean those areas. Um, so that gives them a, a kind of motivational tool. If they don't know how they're doing, they're going to soon get demotivated. It's a bit like if you're trying to lose weight, right? And you haven't got a weighing scale or you look the same. You're going to, after a week or so, your diet's going to, uh, it's not going to work, right? So the self-monitoring element, giving them disclosing tablets, things like that really does help. Finally, keep it simple, um, reinforce it every single time and reinforce their responsibility as well. It's 80% about what do they do at home and 10% about what you, 20% uh, <laughs> never doing my maths, 80% about what do they do at home, 20% about what you do. That's why you say to them, I'm spending so much time on this because it will mean your treatment works and it lasts. Um, so there's a question about water pick um, and things like that. So things of the thing is water pick air floss 
some patients absolutely love it. So if they want to use it as a adjunct, that's fine, but it is not a replacement for incidental brushes. Um, the way I explain it to patients is if you've got a dirty dish, right, and you just rinse it, right, that's like using the, the water pick or the air floss. You can use it if you really want to, but what you really need to do is you need to scrub that dish. That's where the incidentals come into play. You're not going to just rinse it and use the dish again, right? You need to clean it properly. So you can do it if you want to, but it's, it's not a replacement, essentially. Um, and any questions on OH? Uh, yeah, perfect. So, um, and the other thing um, uh, I would say is a mouthwash is another common question. It's not needed. I always, use, I always say to them, it's a bit like, uh, yeah, Janet, it just dislodges food, the uh, water pick. But mouthwash is a bit like perfume after a shower. You don't necessarily need it. It's not health related. And if you do use it, you, need to, you can use it at a different time to brushing. All right, moving swiftly on to actual treatment. So RSD, your patient needs to be highly motivated. Um, and um, will you do RSD in patients with pockets of four millimeters of bleeding or five millimeters and above? I always get asked, how do you decide whether to do um, uh, half mouth, quadrant by quadrant, full mouth? You know what, it doesn't really matter. It's normally down to logistics. It depends how severe the pocketing is, how much LA you're gonna need, um, what the, is the patient's anxiety like? Are they busy? Do they want lots of shorter appointments or one long appointment? It doesn't matter. Um, your probing depth is going to reduce through a number of ways. You usually get about two millimeter improvement in deep pockets and about a millimeter in the shallow, uh, sort of moderate pockets, so uh, five and between five and seven. Uh, and you also get usually about a millimeter of recession, but it will depend on the phenotype. So if you have recorded the phenotype here, I guess it comes into relevance because if they've got a thin phenotype, they will get more recession and you will need to warn them of that. Um, as well as things like black triangles and sensitivity. This is an image, I know it's like a, a rare case, we don't often take radiographs to be honest after non-surgical, but this is just after good non-surgical treatment. And look at this, I mean, you've got bony infill here, um, and we haven't done any surgery. Uh, and the key thing in the pocket is reduced from a nine to a four. Most people would take that tooth out, and I know this is kind of like the one-off case, but non-surgical works so well. Um, and you'll see because uh, some of the most of the patients I see for periodontitis, I largely treat non-surgically. It doesn't necessarily mean because they're going to refer to specialists they need surgery. They don't. Um, but doing good non-surgical treatment is it's amazing what you can achieve. Some of you will be using ultrasonics in practice. Some of you are hand scalers. Some of you are mix. Um, probably majority of you ultrasonics. The key thing I would say about this is um, make sure you are, you are aware of the technique. So with ultrasonics, you start coronally and go apically, whereas with hand scalers, you go um, uh, um, from apical to coronal. Um, I know some of you are asking um, more kind of uh, information on this. As I said, I'm happy to do more uh, webinars on specific, any of these specific topics. The other thing I would say to you guys is make sure your tips aren't worn down. Get one of these um, uh, wear guides from your manufacturer and you basically put the tip on the wear guide and when it gets to red, it's dead. So it means it needs replacing. It makes sense financially as well because if you're going to use a worn down tip, um, it's going to increase your scaling time. It's not going to be as efficient as well. So it just makes sense. Perhaps one of the nurses in your practice can set up an audit um, and you can always ensure you have good uh, quality equipment. So with treatment as well, there's always a question of antibiotics. Do we need antibiotics? Um, and really the answer is in most cases, no. Definitely um, not in, uh, definitely not local antibiotics. I never use that. There's no good evidence for that. But systemic, in specialist practice, I use it a lot, but in general practice, the only time you'd really use it is if your, um, your outcome of treatment is, is very unusual. It's not what you expected in what we used to call kind of the aggressive periodontitis cases, but it should be rare. That kind of patient really needs um, referral, I would say. So whilst we're on this topic, um, you're all doing really well. We've probably got another 15 minutes. Okay? So um, whilst we're on topic of treatment, for peri-implantitis or peri-implant disease, if it's healthy, just all you need to do is reinforce OH. If it's got a bit of bleeding, you just need to reinforce OH and just a gentle suprascale if there's uh, calculus. Don't use these plastic tips, they're awful, uh, especially if uh, they just break up, especially around peri-implantitis cases, and they cause more problems because the plastic gets stuck in the, the pocket and so on. So the reps try and sell them to you, they're, they're not very good. Um, peri-implantitis, as I said, refer early. You don't have very much time for this. Okay, so once you're, um, uh, uh, I'm just going to answer a couple of questions actually before I move on. Um, Isabel, I'm happy to go through that. Airflow, I use 
um, myself, it's brilliant. I really like it. If you are interested in it, let me know. I can um, direct you to the right person. It's great. Um, patients love it. It's good for biofilm removal, um, but it's not essential. Um, but for hygienists, I think it's quite a nice thing to have. Uh, it's great for stain removal as well. So once your patient is healthy, um, they will then move on to something called supportive periotherapy. It used to be called maintenance, but SPT is a better word for it. It's absolutely critical, i.e. you need to actually tell the patient, unless you're going to have maintenance, there's kind of no point in you having treatment. So it needs to be in the treatment plan from the beginning. Um, and the default is um, three months. Uh, and then you can adjust it as needed and uh, depending on how well it's working. Obviously, we want to work closely with the hygienist here. They are the people to be doing the maintenance in practice. So, you know, speak to your hygienist in practice um, uh, and come up with a protocol and make sure you're referring um, appropriately. Make sure there's a prescription for LA I and mean, we could potentially do a whole nother seminar on referring to hygienists and what's needed and what you should say. There's so much I, I want to go through, but it's the first step. So make the most of the hygienists. They're brilliant, um, especially for maintenance. So um, at some point um, uh, and uh, some of the time you might need to refer hopefully to, to my clinic if you don't mind, but for specialist care, either way. Um, remember, this is another uh, medical legal problem. I, I already said this at the beginning, I'm not trying to sound weird, but I will not get you into trouble. And the reason why I'm saying this is some of my friends are specialists, they're very just black and white. And if the patient hasn't been referred at the right time, they'll then say to the patient, oh yeah, you should be referred earlier. And that's how these medical legal cases start. I'm not going to do that. Even if it's a patient that should have been referred earlier, I will cover your back um, because it, we've got enough medical legal issues uh, anyway. So anyway, when do you refer? So there are guidelines for it. And this is why it's, it's the top of list in terms of uh, litigation is because people don't know the guidelines. And the guidelines are that anything that's complexity three, i.e. a BP score of four with an additional risk factor plus stage four grade C, that all needs referring. And you're probably thinking, damn, that's a lot of patients. Well, that's why it's at the top of the list in terms of litigation is because people don't know these guidelines. Now, they might not accept referral, but that's fine. You've covered your back, but they need to medically legally be referred. These are guidelines, so you don't have to follow them. But if something happens, the first thing they will look at is, is uh, do they follow the guidelines? So if you're not going to follow it, it just needs to be justified. It's usually, um, as I said at the beginning, sometimes you think the patient doesn't care. And then suddenly they lose the tooth and the nicest of patients can switch on you. I'm sure you've all had experience of this, right? They can switch on you and they say, hold on, why didn't you refer me? So just refer, uh, don't make any exceptions, um, basically, even if they do, that you're just referring for treatment planning. So what I've just done now is divided the referral cases into three different categories that you should look out for. The first category is your standard periodontitis category, what we used to call aggressive. Patients you've done, a, you know, two after two rounds of non-surgical, you can't keep doing non-surgical treatment and expect a different result. At that point, you either refer or you accept where things are and you put them on maintenance. Um, but those types of patients where you've still got residual pockets, try and get them uh, referred. Sometimes these pockets are affected with, uh, they have vertical defects, um, you know, and what I mean by a deep pocket is at least six and above. Five, sometimes you can maintain, but it's not ideal. But six and above, you cannot maintain. It's, it's hard enough maintaining perio health in these patients. So maintaining deep pockets, it's, it's not going to happen. We need to try and get our patients uh, fully healthy and it is possible. Um, gingival overgrowth as well. So this is your kind of periodontitis category. For example, you've got this patient here, right? Severe perio, young, uh, she's only 32, what we used to call generalized aggressive, deep pockets everywhere. These are her radiographs, very susceptible for her age. The treatment plan was um, OHI, the dentist then took out the lower right eight, they then referred, I did the non-surgical with some antibiotics and I did a little bit of surgery as well. And then referred back to the local hygienist for maintenance. Um, and they're all good now. They've been healthy for a few years. And yes, there is a bit of recession, but there's no pockets. So she's super healthy. She'll keep her teeth for life. The point I want to make here is number one, these patients, even if they're very susceptible, they respond really well. And number two um, is perio is really is a team approach. So you're going to be doing a little bit. I'll be doing a little bit. The hygienist will be doing a little bit. We all need to work together. That's why I think if you're going to be referring, is that's why I want to spend time with you guys to build a good relationship so that you can literally just pick up the phone and call me and say, Rena, uh, actually now I need to take this tooth out. Can you do this instead? Like you need to be able to have that communication. It's not like endo. You just refer them off. They have the root canal and they come back. We need to be working um, closely together. 
The other way to treat pockets is you cut them away. So like this upper seven distal pocket, um, we just do what we call a distal uh, wedge. Basically you just cut out the pocket and reshape the bone. Makes it uh, the pocket from a nine to four, that patient's gonna now keep that tooth. Or what's becoming more common, if you can, you try and regenerate. So you either cut away or you try and regenerate. Um, so with regeneration, um, here you're adding a little bone graft, um, uh, uh, which is end again, and you can see we've got some bony infill and the pocket's gone down. So look out for these types of vertical defects as well. And then finally um, uh, is gingival overgrowth. So you would do a round of treatment first in practice, because you can see it's uh, they've got covered in plaque. Then I'd probably do some surgery and then uh, refer back for maintenance. So look out for these um, types of uh, patients in terms of periodontitis. The second category is recession. Now, once I go through this with my referrers, I tend to get lots of re um, re referrals for this category, but I think it's often missed at the beginning. So what I mean by this, some of you are, be, are going to be are doing Invisalign, um, all those types of treatments. So look out for these cases, um, for example, like this. I mean, this is severe. This should have been referred earlier, but it's a lower um, uh, incisor, post-ortho, re really severe recession. Now, actually here, I'm not worried about the amount of recession. I'm worried about the quality of the gum tissue. The quality of the gum tissue here is unattached, non-keratinized, very inflamed. So this patient is not purposely missing out cleaning that tooth. It's actually really sore when they clean it because of the quality of the gum. Therefore, they miss it. Therefore, it recedes further because it's so thin and therefore it gets worse. So this needs to be caught early. And what we do is something called a free gingival graft. It's super predictable. I probably do this on a weekly basis. It's so easy and so predictable. Take a little piece from the palette, stitch it on. You've got some nice thick gum. It's more resistant now, right? So it can, you can brush it comfortably. It's not going to recede even if you get a little bit of plaque there. Um, it hurts a little bit for about a week in the palette. It feels like a burn, but they're sorted for the rest of their life. It's, it's not going to be needed again. So look out for these cases. This was a pet, one of my referrers. Uh, he did some Invisalign. Unfortunately, one of the teeth really receded quite badly, but we managed to get improve the quality. If he had left that, she would lose that tooth. If you're doing Invisalign and that patient ends up losing the tooth, that's not a good thing. Um, so try and look out for these cases. Um, but remember, we're not trying to cover the recession. We're trying to improve the quality. Where we are trying to cover it is in the aesthetic zone. So for upper teeth, you then will do a different procedure, like a coronally advanced flap to actually cover the recession. Um, if I'm completely honest, like before I did my specialist training, I didn't even know this stuff existed. That's why I'm showing you. Like sometimes it's just what we can do now with mucogingival surgery is amazing. Um, so here, you know, it's going to make a big difference to your final results um, and the smile. Here, I, one of my referrers, they did a, uh, they did some bonding up to the CEJ, and then I did a graft to coronary advance of that. So you can get some pretty good results. Um, in terms of, um, uh, Mihir, I just looked at your question, in terms of your views of ortho on teeth post uh, grafts, is yes, it's totally fine. Um, I would say if you're thinking of do, starting ortho, refer them for an assessment and then we can decide when it should be done. Should we do it first? Should we do it after? It depends on the, on, on the situation. This is a more of a, a severe case. So that's your second category. And then your final category is crown lengthening, restorative or aesthetic. Um, uh, I can help with that. I actually want to, speaking to Mo and Sanjay, I want to try and actually set up some hands-on stuff for you guys, like hands-on crown lengthening, because some of the easy stuff like this, it will be great for you to be able to do it in practice if you're not already. Um, like restorative crown lengthening is a great skill to have. Aesthetic, you know, this patient's now, the dentist's gonna do some Invisalign bonding, uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, but crown lengthening, aesthetic, if it's just one tooth can make a big, big difference. So again, look out for these cases. It's really fun um, uh, working with you guys on things like this. I, I have a great time refer working with the referrers on cases like this. You can get some really nice um, results. So with referring, obviously you have a few options. Now, I've seen a couple of questions on this, so I'll go through this. NHS referrals are a total nightmare. So I work at King's as well. So I'm in, I'm in private practice and I'm at King's. And the last time we accepted a referral was a very long time ago. Um, there's just no funding. So if they don't fit the hospital criteria, if they're a standard perio case, they're likely to be rejected. So then your next port of call is, I know you guys don't have in-house, hence why I'm trying to get on board is not an in-house periodontist, but someone consistent that you refer to, essentially that's together dental refers to. So your next port of call is private. So your patients will ask you questions like, um, uh, uh, if you have it in-house, that's, that's fine, but if you don't, um, or your patients in London, then obviously um, feel free to refer. Your patients will, have, uh, will ask you a few questions like, why can't you do it, right? Why can't you do the treatment? 
can't you just refer me to um, uh, these? Uh, can't you just refer me to um, uh, the hygienist, for example? Can't you just refer me to the hospital? So you know, you can say things like, "Do you fit the NHS criteria?" I can try, but um, I may not get accepted. All those types of things. So um, you you are in your right uh, to recommend your recommended option. You know, if your patient trusts you, if your recommended option is um, X specialist, then go for it. Um, uh, but give your patient the recommended option. Um, for those of you in London um, and anyone else who wants to uh, refer, um, I think we're trying to uh, basically create a consistent specialist practice that we refer to so we can keep all the care consistent, the communication consistent. And I can also train you guys up as well uh, and visit you in practice. So um, feel free to um, uh, message me after. I'll send you a bit of information after, but it's really easy to refer uh, and it's really quick. Um, so it'll be good to work with you guys. Um, a lot of the time you'll get questions on um, expense as well, especially when it's private. So I'll go through this. But the first thing you'll probably say is my patients aren't accepting. So a couple of things to say if your patients aren't accepting is say to them how severe the condition is. Right. Say you will lose your teeth. This may have an impact on general health. And once you're healthy, you can refer back. Right. It's not like you're going to forever have to go to the specialist in town to get treated. So the communication side is really important. Um, if they say it's too expensive. Um, try and put things into perspective for them, right? Firstly, um, we offer on interest-free finance plans. So they can split the payment over like 10 months. It's like 60 pound a month. It's like a gym membership, basically. Um, also, what's the cost of not treating it? If they lose a tooth, right? And they need an implant, an implant is like three grand. My treatment plan will never go over 2K. The whole mouth, that's not just one molar. So put it into perspective for them. Um, uh, and what's the cost per tooth? The cost per tooth is probably like 60 pound tooth. So when you put it into perspective, even if people aren't, um, uh, you know, extremely well off, they normally, my, most of my patients are from NHS practices. Some of the people are unemployed, but they can still get a finance plan. So don't rule off just because of finance. Um, just put it into perspective for them. So just to finish off, um, let me just quickly... Uh, uh, so Rishi, I'm just reading your question. If patient recommends a specialist, then declines on financial grounds. So the key thing is you can only do what you can do, right? So if they don't accept referral for whatever reason, just put it in your notes, patients declined referral, and then you have to offer it again at the next appointment because uh, they may change their minds. It has to be done every single time. You can't just do it once and then leave it. It has to be done every single uh, time, but that's all you can do. And then you have to just do as much as you can. You just maintain what you've achieved, making it clear to them. You're just slowing down the progression of the condition. You're not trying to improve the situation or save teeth. Um, Jignesh, yeah, that we, I will send you a copy of the webinar. I know some of you have got, uh, some of you are quite far out from London, but um, Moira and Sanjay said you might feel some of your patients may not mind traveling into town. But those of you in London, um, I'll hopefully be visiting you soon anyway, like uh, those in Clapham, Wandsworth, Whitechapel, all of those. So I'll try and uh, hopefully um, kind of visit you and hopefully we can work together essentially. Um, and uh, this question, should hy hygienists do a first? I would say if it's a standard peri patient, say to them, I could refer you at this stage, but do you want to try some in-house treatment first? So that you've planted the seed, go and see the hygienist, and then they can refer if, need, uh, if needed. So um, when I get to know you all guys, in, uh, and I'll email you as well, if you've got any more questions on, especially referring, just let me know and we can go through it and I can give you a call as well if easier. But um, I will also try and visit you guys too. Um, anyway, record keeping, as a final slide, I'm going to send you this PowerPoint. I just want you to, I've just included some phrases that you might want to use when you're updating your templates. And I just thought as another medical legal thing, um, just take a look at that. So in conclusion, it's just half past now. Um, I hope you found that useful. I know it's a lot of information, but I just wanted to get going with all the key points. And then um, if you give me some feedback, if you're happy to refer, I'm happy to um, give back and train you guys up and go through anything you want to um, as well. So just let me know.